Hi, welcome everyone uh, to DevSecOn Hungary first event on the container security. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, invite everyone in this event. Uh, we have uh, another speaker, Tale, who are going to talk about some container vulnerability and uh, how we're going to cope with that, uh, container safekeeping. And I will go into more detail on uh, vulnerability uh, scanning and uh, yeah, open those tools and using uh, some of the snake tools as well. So yeah, a little bit housekeeping. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to leave in the comment section on your YouTube so we could uh, able to see them or answer them. Yeah, so or on on uh, during the during the session, and uh, yeah, we're more than happy to answer any questions. So. Yeah, my name is Madhukumar Yaluri. Just a quick intro by myself. I'm a principal cloud architect uh, working for T-Systems International. I'm also a DevSecCon uh, chapter lead for Hungary and uh, AWS uh, community builder. Uh, yeah, it's running uh, various events for local uh, development communities to help share knowledge across uh, various uh, various sectors, various uh, yeah um, points here. Okay, I will quickly introduce to my other speaker, Tale. Hello, hello. Hello, and good, good morning from Brazil. <laughs> yeah, we, today we will speak about uh, container security and we have a, a breakfast together while I'm speaking. We we will learn and we I we, we enjoy my my coffee. It's a, a little bit different, no, because it's a open conversation. Uh, I really appreciated the invite. Thank you. It's a it's a great opportunity. Cool. Thanks, Ale, joining from Brazil. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Those of you might have been aware, so we have a little bit of glitch with the speaker, so being unwell. And we have to change the speaker in the last minute. So yeah, DevSecOn community came in handy, and they you know they helped us uh, secure Tale in the last minute. And uh, thanks for you, <laughs> uh, Tale, for jumping in and you know uh, for your passion to help our community and you know uh, share your knowledge as well. I really appreciate that. Okay, so how are we all doing today? Then give me some thumbs up. So what's your mood check? Yeah, happy Friday. Yeah, everyone uh, curious to end the week, right? Yes, the best day of the week, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we have a couple of minutes just to uh, give a, a little bit background as well. So we have uh, people who attended the Container Immersion Day uh, before with me on the AWS group. I think I've, I've recognized most of your participants uh, who registered here in this account. Uh, for this event. So I really appreciate them for coming along uh, and, you know, uh, following us and spreading the word. You know, I, I really appreciate that uh, guys who rejoined uh, my sessions, uh, yeah, from the Container Mission Day. We also have some, uh, yeah, goodies at the end. I mean, uh, yeah, I would like to reward with some uh, $100 AWS uh, credits. Uh, those of you who are interested to uh, explore any container services on Amazon Web Services. So sneak, uh, stay still at the end of the session. So we would, uh, yeah, we would uh, we would announce uh, some something about about that, uh, yeah, reward. Yeah. So be active, ask more questions, be engaging, and uh, my lovely colleague will Sam probably will announce at the end. Yeah, who will be the winner? So yeah, we we will. Uh, we will come to that bit. So yeah, just uh, okay. The the networking is part of the community. You know, we can, of course, we are. I'm remote, and we we met each other yesterday, and we are we can learning more today. Uh, and this is this is good. You know, sometimes if you start. Uh, a class or buy some course in the internet you you don't have the you don't uh, learn too much because sometimes you don't have the the network some colleague can help you can give some tips that you need to to learn a lot some ways to make it easy especially 
about security, you know, security is uh, it's not a complex uh, content, but uh, is um uh, is important point, you know, you must be you need to understand some concepts to make uh, everything good when you develop some code or create or build some application. Absolutely. So it's more of awareness, isn't it, Tyler? So uh, people are aware of security, but it's more of you know awareness bringing to the development uh, life cycle, how you can embed into your coding, into your you know container life cycle, how you basically make sure you're yeah you're more secure when you host in your test or production, right? So that's our Discord uh, community. Uh, if you feel feel free to please join, we have a very big community there. We help each other with uh, security topics. Yeah, they are uh, experts, and you know, we learn from each other. It's a very, very, yeah, very uh, humble community where we can exchange our views, learn from each other. So I would uh, encourage you guys to, yeah, please follow us and uh, join us in the community. Nice. Okay, uh so Tale, uh, I would say. Without any further ado, then uh, we will uh, crack on with our first session of the event, uh, which is uh, container safekeeping. And I will hand out to my lovely colleague, uh, yeah, Tale. Okay. Cool. I'm share my oh my screen. I'm I I start to work with Mac OS. We was talking yesterday. I used to have some difficulties with the the keyboard. Is a lot of new keys for me, a lot of new shortcuts, but I am I hope uh, until the end of the year, <laughs> I will be expert in, <laughs> in Mac OS. As you mentioned yesterday, I will be most, most productive, I hope, because I make an effort to learn the, the shortcuts and it, uh, it's good. It's the part, you know, I, uh, I start to work with Linux, a lot of years ago, and uh, and they start to work. I think, oh, this is very hard. And today, I really like work with Linux, and I think the the Mac is the same. Let me put in the presentation mode here. Okay. Okay. Now is in the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, I will uh, introduce myself uh, with more details. If you have um, uh, any question during my my uh, my presentation, feel free to to ask. And uh, I'm not English native. Uh, English is my second language. Uh, sorry if you don't understand some word. I'm trying to uh, be clear. Uh, sometimes some word is a uh, is a challenge, you know, to pronounce it. Uh, if I can repeat, if you don't understand, don't worry. But uh, but okay. Uh, my name is Thales Casagrande. You can call me Taleco. Is my nickname. Uh, I'm from Brazil, as I mentioned before. I'm from Santa Catarina. Uh, Santa Catarina is like the the California, you know. It's a lot of beats, so beautiful. Today, I'm based in Curitiba. Is Curitiba is one hour from São Paulo. São Paulo is, I think, the most popular São Paulo in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I like to drink a coffee, beer. I play coffee dirty, Warzone. If you like to play with me, we can play together. My favorite drink is Negroni. I practice CrossFit, and uh, I'm not Brazilians is uh, very popular about soccer, but I'm not popular with soccer. I my favorite team is Grêmio, and if you want to connect me, you can uh, scan this QR code. We can here have everything about me. We can connect and uh, talk if you have any question in the future. Well, uh, I'm a sales engineer in the, in the vendor, and I am part of Sneaky Ambassador. I'm work with IT very long years, almost uh, 
nine years in security. I start my my graduation with uh, analysis and developer of system. This is uh, a fun fun fact because I never work with a developer uh, because I will talk more in the future about this this presentation. But uh, uh, when I start my career in IT, I I start with a developer, but. Uh, I move to infrastructure and security, and today I I think is very important to understand the the developer side, and in my background that I study uh, was very important to me, and uh, today in last uh, couple couple months ago. I'm recapping something about developer studying more Python. I think it's very important to automate it, a lot of things. Uh, and I'm I have some certifications and I'm focused today in my master business in the DevSecOps. I, I really like the, the DevSecOps. But okay, this is uh, about me, but today is not about me, is about uh, is about containers, right? Uh, I, I would like to uh, move, move some step back to we move together uh, forward, right? Uh, I was reading uh, a book and uh, I never know what is the, the name, why is container. And I, I like the, the sea, I like the, the boats, I like the pirates, I like the and uh, uh, I was reading in this is very interesting for me because uh, in the shipping industry have a, a standard. This standard is for the for container. We are not still talking about the container image. We are talking about the, the container with a, a boat. It's a standard that facilitated st stacking and very easy to unload with a crane, no matter that is inside. Then imagine we are in during the transportation uh, or, when, or when we buy something from the internet, uh, we the your, uh, that thing you buy came across the, the world by in a, container no and this point you can move doesn't matter what is inside and there is no problem right because is a um, is a standard we can stack a lot of uh, containers and no problem when you talk about software we still uh, have the the we still talk about the containers. We should talk about the stacking, about our stacking software. We use a lot of language, right? Uh, we use a lot of language in different environments. And sometimes we use, I don't know, we develop it inside of Windows, inside of Linux. And uh, we develop it, um, we use the containers now. Uh, now in last uh, days is going very popular. Um, but imagine uh, this container now. This contain that this container uh, is very beautiful. It's clear. It's perfect. But this one is not good. Uh, it's not safe. Have uh, there are a lot of issues. Uh, now imagine our applications, our services that we went to deliver to our customer. It's not safe if you build an application, if you develop a software like this, no, with a lot of uh, problems. Uh, some some guy crash with the. I don't know the car here. I don't know what happened. Uh, and we, when we develop a software, we have a lot of things 
to to think like where will you uh, put where will you developer where our our code will be hosted like in cloud if you talk about cloud we have a lot of things about the infrastructure to 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 learn and understand before put the code right and uh it's like the same here you know we make it put the infrastructure here imagine the the kubernetes here and then now in inside of the the boat the containers uh, are managing by jenkins for example the jenkins is the crane putting some things the jenks or other two and this idea um, is the same right uh, modern software uh, is not is not different we are building containers all the time we create our image or sometimes we uh, get the image from the internet for example the docker hub or another repository and we need to understand uh, where is my my problem and uh, if i'm looking uh, for this container i can see a lot of problems right but how I, I can prioritize the fix? I need, for in this example, I need to start in painting. I need to start uh, cleaning. I don't know. We have we need some metrics to start with the step by step to fix uh, the problem. In the software is the same the same way. We need to uh, understand our situation. We need to understand some points about, uh, okay, I'm developer, I'm starting to write a code, but uh, uh, what is a vulnerability? This vulnerability can, uh, lots of vulnerability, let's use the word issue. This issue can impact my software because when, when they start my graduation in developer, um, I, I had one uh, during my, my graduation, one schedule talking about security, but not was focusing security code. This is about security software like IP tables, like a proxy, right? And sometimes it's the same from the from the dev. The dev, the developer have a lot of lot of information to learn, a lot of new languages to learn, and uh, he. Uh, knows about security, but it's a, a different point. Sometimes he understand what is a SQL injection, for example, but uh, is WASP top 10, top 10, but it is a lot of information. And sometimes is we need to put the software in the production. And this is can if you don't understand some problems some issues that we have in our software we is not good or we have a problems in the future if you put in production our software with bugs or uh, vulnerabilities we have a spending more time fixing after than in production it can have a lot of problems and it's not it's good not for, for for the for the customer right we need to uh, uh, understand better then uh, i will give some some ways to understand and how to prioritize in the fix in the end i will using uh i sneak tool to give more tips to make understandable the my way to help you to prioritize in the, the vulnerabilities, okay? Because we have, when you are developing a software, we have a lot of issues all the time. If you create a new software now, and with the, the last version of the libraries or the, the software, we still have the vulnerabilities or issues. If you use, for example, um, official image base from the Docker Hub, for example, just example, please, is uh, Ubuntu or the Alpine, the official Im image, we still have some vulnerabilities. And 
this kind this vulnerability can be a, a problem for us but we can use some tools to automate it and uh, give us some insights to fix today i will explain a little bit more about sneak but uh, until the end of the this meetup we we learn more about these kind of tools right and uh, here um we have um, some questions i really like the questions uh, i like the questions sometimes i question myself about something and uh, i prepare some questions here to uh make our uh make this pre presentation easy you know uh, I have some questions here. Uh, some questions is, do you trust the image are you putting in the production? Do you know the origin? Uh, because sometimes we just um, take the image from the Docker Hub, makes, uh, uh, we change some configurations and put in the productions, right? Uh, we we can do or we do some security tests in our environment uh the pain i think uh, here is uh, the dev devsecops philosophy is is very strong but we need and we we need improve all the time to create security software and here doesn't matter is doesn't matter is a uh, uh, a big word you know but uh, here the point is you you must use a security check a security gate doesn't matter if it's in your ecr if you are using an open source tool um, for example you need to start checking to understand what is my problem right and here i have one more question uh, Okay. Oh, I have a question here. Yeah, we have Hi, a you. question from the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> can you give us small ex uh, real life uh, example what kind of vulnerability we can face during the production? Yes, this is um this is a, a good question. In my in my demo I have some in some I have some examples, but uh, we can talk, for example, about the, the log4j. Log4j was like a, a, a boom uh, about the, the, the vulnerability in, in Java. No? When you, if you are using the library, we, we must fix it. Or, or uh, in Python, for example, if you have uh, this library or uh, a web vulnerability, if you expose your application and uh, you have some problem with SQL injection, you must uh, check and uh, uh, and understand where is the, the pain point, where is the surface attack and use some tools you, you can uh fix and understand more about this i will show i will show the some tips in the uh in the demo right yeah cool so just to add basically you know, uh, uh, when you go live so any vulnerability caused because of your code being updated and outdated uh, from lack of security patches the base image which you're using in your container so that causes a problem when you go live, right? So that will give an opportunity for the hackers to hack in. Yeah, if you're not keeping up to date, if you're vulnerable, uh, so yeah, that's that's what we're going to talk about more in detail today. But thanks for the question, Igbido. And and keep the the application up to date is a is is a challenge, you know, because vulnerabilities uh, we have new vulnerabilities all the day. And we we have some security controls that we can use to to protect, right? Is is if we are using the uh, web application, we can put a runtime application self protect to protect application. We can use a web application firewall to protect. We can uh, segment uh, uh, 
our application. We have a lot of ways to to put some uh, workarounds to protect the, the environment. Uh, another question is uh, is about uh, the the base image, right? Uh, the base image you have the just the necessary that that we need, or we use a, a big image. Uh, I remember I saw in some environment productions a lot of images with uh, one gigabyte. is a very big image, and uh, how are now, uh, in now how the security team can help uh, the developer, right? Because in, in general, uh, the developer team sometimes just to give you a report. Hey, we have these vulnerabilities in the environment. You must dev. You must fix. And this is not the best way. We need help. We need to give some. Uh, informations how to prioritize the vulnerabilities, right? And that's it. Uh, we have the issues. We have some some questions that make us think about the problem. And now I will uh, start a demo with some giving some uh, with a tool that we can help us to understand the, the problems. Uh, I let to uh, ask the demo gods that you make everything be okay. Uh, but I sometimes, you yeah. know, we work with technology problems happen all the time. We'll try, we'll try. Hopefully it goes well. Cool. Uh, I, will, I will demo in two steps. The first time we are, uh, I will use the Isnik. Uh, Isnik is a platform that can help uh, us to find and fix vulnerability in our code, in our open source uh, libraries, in the, our container. Uh, if you don't have an account, it's pretty easy to start. No credit card required. Just to, uh, open your browser app dot .io. You you uh, I will log in with my GitHub account, or you can use your Bitbucket Bitbucket account, Google, Azure, Docker ID. Okay. Well, uh, I'm I uh, I have here some projects that I tested before. Right, but uh, after you create your account, you can see a lot of integrations. These integrations will help you to uh, protect your environment and get some security feeds that you can prioritize in the security. Here I'm connected with my GitHub, but you can connect your Bitbucket, you can connected with your Docker Hub, your ECR, a lot of, uh, lot of integrations. Uh, one integration that I really like is the command line we, we will use the, in this demo. Install the command line. The command line is important because we can use the command line to run commands to scan our container, to scan our dependencies, to scan our code. is a powerful tool. If you develop it in Windows, I don't know, or Mac, or you can use NPM to install. Uh, install the, uh, the Snick command line. You must authenticate it. When you use this command, you see a link that will be redirected a page to authentication. After this, you can start to work, right? Just to use this link monitor, right? Okay. Let's back here. Go to projects. Here, uh, I have all the the projects that I imported before. I, I, for this demo, I will use uh, a vulnerability application. This vulnerability is not recommended you 
to use in production environment, right? Is the sneaky goof? Uh, you can uh, you can monitor uh, public repos. You can monitor uh, just click here. You can monitor uh, private with GitHub integrations or public. If you are monitor uh, a public, you just click in monitor public GitHub repo. Uh, you can copy the, the project, for example. You can copy the, the, the link, paste it here. After you you paste, you the sneak will start the analysis. And here we have the information of the, the package, the library, the Docker file, and the code. But today we are focused on the, the Docker file. Here I have some information about the the uh One severity. Yeah. Severity. yes i i was i missing the, the word in, in my mind <laughs> thank, you. thank you uh you can when you have a, a detection for example you can send the the alert via slack for example and here uh we have more information about the image we we have some suggestions oh you are using this this current image uh, is node is node is node six stretch. We have a lot of vulnerabilities, but you can upgrade to another version that you have less vulnerabilities. This the severity uh, only one high, right? This is a, a some recommendations that you. Uh, you can follow, right? And here I have some, I have more information about the vulnerability in my uh, in my Docker file. I have when this vulnerability was introduced. Here, this important uh, can help the security and the developer guy is the exploit maturity. Exploit is a code. Uh, this code is used to the bad guys to find um, a lack in this in the software to to find the vulnerability and exploit and run malicious code, right? And a good point is uh, uh, another good good thing that I like is the the trending. This vulnerability is trending on Twitter. Okay, uh, this indicated is a going thread. Okay, let's let's see here. We can see all the the information about this vulnerability. Eight hours ago, or some days ago, this guy talking about the, the vulnerability. We can see more information here based in the based in the Twitter. Right? This guy published a code. To, I think to exploit. Here I have some details about the criticity. Here I have uh, more information about the common injection, the attacks, attack complexity, the confidentiality, the integrity. These these are the pillars of the security information. Uh, and have information how to fix. Have a lot of more information here. Uh, we can see the common weakness. The common weakness can help you understand the weakness, the weak of the application. Uh, in all the detections, we have the uh, the version that we have the fix, right? And here we we can understand. Okay, we have a critical vulnerability. I can start. Uh, uh, we can see the issues with a filter, and only see the the critical vulnerabilities. We can check the the score. Uh, and here, based in this information, we can uh, talk with the dev to fix the vulnerability, okay? Based in, uh, let's back here. Take another one. 
they can we can talk about the complex attack for example this vulnerability uh, is 90.8 when you are studying this score 90.8 is a good score we can pass in the class but we can when you talk about the vulnerability this score is very critical we need a uh, fix uh, as fast as uh, as possible right and here we have the information the comp complex attack is low right and here the, the attack vector is network is not required the privilege attack not required the user interaction what this means that the 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 attackant the the ha not hacker but the bad guy can exploit and the user don't need interaction to uh to the the attack have a successful right but okay, uh, here I'm showing the the a common, not common, the guy, the, the sneak console. But I think the the developer prefer using like a, a command line to check, right? It's, it's fast. Here I have the history. I have the history about the uh, about the vulnerability. If I fix. I can see the the number decrease, right? Well, uh, this the 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 web guy he can help the security guys or the developer, but the developer can start using the the command line, right? I you do the the same here. I can use the the command. Uh, of the each colony but uh here i'm cloning the the hepo back to the vs code so basically whatever they seen in the uh website like you know gui you can also achieve that by command line right yes perfect perfect but so before some people, are, some people are used to command line some people are used to you know uh, gui so based on your preference uh, sneak will let you you know choose uh, yes uh, of course big 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 uh, before we use the the command line i need uh, uh, i show okay. before we we need the integration. We need to install the, the the command line tool. It's pretty easy. It's just to copy and paste the, the command. Yeah. Uh, when here we have the uh, a powerful command line, we can use it to authenticate it, to test it, to monitor the, the container. We can find the vulnerability with the log for per shell we can see we have a uh, all things here uh, okay uh, let's uh, go to the my project is Nikki Goof. okay I will uh, just build the, the image <laughs> So we're building a simple, probably JavaScript application uh, to create an image. Yes. Uh, I have some. In, uh, I tested before. If it's just something, have some problem. I, I, I show my. Well, while build, just to uh, give more. We save time. I will go to the applications that uh, I already built. It. Yeah, I think it is the best. <laughs> okay. okay, let's go to the Isnik Goof Lab. Okay, I use the 
the command line is nick container is nick goof uh, i built the uh before uh is nick test is nick container test goof. so what is happening in the background there uh, tala oh good question sorry um uh, the the command line of the sneak is is scanning my my project my dependencies inside of my this sneak goof project right the the analysis is looking for uh, vulnerability or issues uh, that uh, i have in in the end of this analysis i will have the same information of the the web console right we can yeah. see all the information about the vulnerability now here in this moment is querying the the database here well we have uh, all the information here based in critical we have the we have the the info link we have the the version that have the the fix we have in the end we have the same information the recommendations to upgrade the number of vulnerabilities the beige image type and here uh, we don't use the the command line we don't use the web gi right we can use the command line to have the same information we can scan our of our projects and it can be very, very fast. I think it make more sense, right? Yeah. This, yeah. this, this information is the, the same. Let's back okay. here. Yeah, so basically whatever you're seeing on the console when you scan the, your repository, so you see on the, on the command line as well. Yes. Uh, just for we end, Oh, uh, uh, here. Okay. Uh, well, based in in our information, where we can start? We can start with the vulnerabilities we have the CVE like uh, seven or eight to prioritize, it, right? Um, I can start with vulnerabilities that have a, a exploit, for example. This is a, a good way to start. We always have a question here, right? Because we make it uh, uh, ask to ourselves to understand and uh, look at the application. And we have a, a strong knowledge base of it. We can use it to understand and, and see the vulnerability right uh, it based in the information if if the vulnerability have a uh a cvs like a nine like score nine like eight for example the surface attack the surface complexity the use interaction uh i i need to uh, spend more time in this kind of vulnerability to fix after uh uh, putting, uh, prioritizing my, uh, in my backlog, then start to be, create a new, right? Fixing these critical vulnerabilities with exploit or, uh, or uh, have a, a big score CVE, we can decrease the surface attack in our, in our environment. You can, our application will be safe, right? I think, uh, this is the the message. If you if you have some questions, you can send a message in the LinkedIn. We can send me a, a Twitter message. Yeah. Just yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, just sneak. Also, it doesn't really find the vulnerabilities. It also tells you, you know uh, what you can do when you find this kind of vulnerabilities to avoid your risk. Of your application, yeah. So it also uh, automatically creates the pull request in a click of a button to for your yes. GitHub. 
and it it also suggests you okay uh, this is what i think you know it's the best one so as soon as you realize okay i would like to go with a, a different version of a base image which contains uh, less security uh, less vulnerabilities uh, less uh, severe critical uh, vulnerabilities so i would just click here as uh, tali was showing so that will automatically create a pull request on uh, github uh, somebody have to you know uh, peer review uh, you can merge it and then yeah it, it's pretty neat too i i use it personally and uh, yeah it helps a lot you can also use sneak to scan your community projects in github which you support which you contribute uh, that also helps them to find the vulnerabilities in their code and you can request you know raise a pull request for them as well so I, I, that's what i do in uh, you know docker community docker also also docker I, you know I, i support some of the projects in github uh, I, i i i help find the vulnerability using sneak and uh, raise a pull request for them so it's pretty neat too yes and and another point if uh, in this if the vulnerability we can ignore of course because uh we can ignore uh uh we can uh, ignore temporary or permanently based in days if if i mean well Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Chaba. So thanks. Is basically, you know, uh, any vulnerability tool needs a vulnerability database. Yeah. Yes. So that's how it can't again. So his question is basically, will it be in his local machine or will it be mm -hmm. exported uh, from uh, somewhere? The when we start the scan, the the command line will ask to sneak API about in the vulnerability database. You can you can uh, export the information after the scan, right? This information you can export to a, a JSON format, for example. But the the inf information about the vulnerability database is from Sneak, right? But if you use, uh, uh, I think, open source. Uh, DB, you can you can make some queries you can import or export or create another tool to to scan i think this is possible yeah yeah so it depends on what vulnerability tool you're using chaba so uh, snake uh, obviously now have the api where in the background checks in their database and give you a summary like uh, this what tale shown If you're using some of the open source tools like uh, ClayDB or Encore or you know some of the open uh, stuff, you will install the uh, Postgres database locally, which it connects, and you know uh, you yeah you have to keep it up to date and stuff like that. So yeah, yes, there are two ways you can do that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this is where you you provide your comment. I think yeah, that's a good one. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So second half of your question, Chaba. So that's how you provide your feedback to them. So it goes to uh, the vulnerability uh, application, and they act basically if there's anything that they have to fix. Cool. Uh, thanks, Tale. That was uh, brilliant. I learned some uh, new things on the sneak as well, <laughs> you know, myself. So uh, that was that was pretty good. Yes, that was pretty good. Okay. Thank you. It's my it's my my pleasure. Thank you for. Advise me. Sorry about my my my, my English. Uh, I'm no, you're pretty good, improving all the day. Some words in my mind. There are a thousand of Thales translating and thinking English <laughs> back. <laughs> no, you're pretty good. Pretty good. I I, I really personally enjoyed it and uh, learned a few uh, new things as well. The CLI one, which I did normally use, but yeah, I know now where to get, how to use it. Yeah, so I have to assess those uh, weaknesses which I not aware of before. So I know where to go and check them. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, a lot of uh, useful info there. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's one more question. Uh, can you pull multiple images? Yes, you, you can if you have um, GitHub integration. Yes, Docker Composer. If you have a uh, Uh, GitHub integrations, you will see all, all of your images or in your projects, or if you have ECR integration, you can see the the images that you have in your repo. It's, it's possible. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can scan multiple images with uh, Snake. I mean, there's a limit, I think, uh, for the open source, how many scans you can do per month. Uh, it's around 200 or something for Docker. Uh, in Docker, a scan itself integrated Sneak in the background. So if you install Docker, uh, if you're running Docker locally, if you do a Docker scan uh, yeah. behind the scenes, uh, it uses Sneak uh, uh, to scan the images. And uh, I think there's a limit for 200 scans or something per month. And you can upgrade that uh, yeah, uh, as and when you need uh, or based on your need. Uh, but there are also a couple of open source tools which I'm going to go through in this other session. But yes, you could you could manage to do that. Yes. Cool. Any other questions from the audience or anything you want to add, Tali? On the what's the what's the message that you would like to give, right? So what's the message that for container safekeeping? What's the most key important points? Um, my message is. Uh, it's a it's a good question. My message is uh, understand the the vulnerability, understand the the issue, right? If it, if it makes sense, to have a impact in your environment. Just to prioritize it, right? Spending some minutes, sometimes talking with the IT guy, the sec the security guy. Sorry, uh, uh, to understand the environment, understanding the business to create a safe a safe code and uh, put the security all the time you know you uh, doesn't matter if it's step by step starting scanning your your images start scanning your library and putting security gates that you have a, a completely uh, out of security gate right make the security easy not uh, uh, a problem this is my my always my recommendation cool thanks Ale. that was uh, that was brilliant uh, uh i don't see any other questions coming uh in that case uh, i will uh, we can move to the next topic uh, Perfect. i'm just watching if something else is coming up no okay i will just quickly change it to presenter mode and uh, we can uh, Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. Okay. So that's our call. Uh, just quickly about me again. So as you guys know from my uh, AWS events, uh, I lead and uh, and I know, uh, create, you know, organize events on the AWS uh, communities, uh, largely on uh, container uh, topics and also security topics. I'm uh, originally from uh, India, but I'm uh, Indian British. Uh, I have my home in uh, England and uh, yeah, my second home is now in Hungary. So yeah, uh, I traveled across uh, US, Europe, and Middle East. Uh, I lived and worked there in those places. Uh, as a contractor, so I worked with uh, multiple customers on different sectors. Uh, that's a good opportunity for me, you know, uh, to learn uh, various uh, cultures, uh, yeah, various aspects of IT, how they, you know, work, how they operate. So that was really good learning for me during this uh, last decade or two, um, which also helped me. I'm also AWS uh, Solution Architect and a Security Specialist on Amazon Web Services. I also lead the container uh, services within uh, T-Systems as a product owner for uh, yeah, Docker, uh, Kubernetes, ECS, EKS, and OpenShift, Rosa. Uh, we create uh, value-added services for the customers, uh, which I'm leading at that aspect as well. So I have experience working with most of the hyperscalers, uh, AWS, uh, Google, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Microsoft, and I have also worked with a lot of uh, service integrators, partners uh, in the cloud migration journey. So, yeah, that's me. In a nutshell, I like. I, I'm, I'm more passionate about bringing the communities, local communities, together, share knowledge. Yeah, so uh, I help each other, learn from each other. So I really like this kind of events where we, you know, uh, bring various uh, backgrounds, uh, technical background, dev guys uh, together, 
share our knowledge, you know, uh, yeah, learn from each other. I, I really like this community events where we uh, benefit from each other. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, container security, vulnerability scanning. So this is a more le level next on uh, what Tyler has already covered. So first thing is like, you know, what are vulnerabilities? Yeah, how do you would like to view them? How do you address them on a high level where Tyler has uh, gone through and how you basically use Snake to uh, address those most of the vulnerabilities as well, right? So that's what I'm going to cover. High level, uh, I would like to stress on the cloud native security white paper. So the CNCF, they published a white paper version two uh, last month or beginning of this month, a new version. I would like to highly uh, cover on a very high level on what it talks about, what they recommend to do, uh, yeah, uh, about on, on the four life cycles, they call it. And, uh, you know, very high level, not too much detail, but I'll give you the link. On the white paper, feel free to learn. I, I like it, uh, how how they recommend, how they advise. Uh, and we quickly go on the Docker file best practices. So any container you build, so this is the basis if you're using Docker uh, to create any of your container images. On a high level, we go through what are the best practices to create your Docker file. We use, uh, yeah, wherever you host your containers, so you have to make sure you harden your host where you're running those containers. So we will look into uh, two open source tools where we can use to harden your uh, Docker host or your container host where you're running your images using uh, Docker Bench and uh, KubeBench, one for Docker and uh, for the Kubernetes. We also use some, uh, uh, learn about some open source tools, how you can make your uh, container images more secure and uh, more smaller and secure as well. So I would uh, leave the snake bit because we already covered, but I would cover more on the open source plus Amazon uh, Elastic Container Registry Service as well. And we have we will go through the container services where you host on how you host or how you run on AWS, very high level, but we concentrate on uh, ECR, Elastic Container Registry, or we automatically get some security alerts based on the images you push. And uh, we look into EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service on Amazon. Uh, what are the best practices? Uh, I know a lot of guys are from Kubernetes background, container background. So I thought it would be, you know, a little uh, useful. So we concentrated on the EKS and uh, yeah, mainly on the security aspects. Before you host anything or your ports in your EKS, what are the security you know, responsibility metrics? And uh, we'll come to the questions. So first, uh, CNCF, yeah, uh, white paper, security white paper. So what is it all about? So a uh, first phase they talk about is the develop phase. So any security for you know uh, cloud native applications uh, that needs to be applied throughout the uh, lifecycle of your application. And the first phase would be you know the develop phase where. Uh, uh, it's a resulting in the creation of your artifacts, like, you know, uh, infrastructure as a code or your images, your manifest files, right? Uh, that will be used to deploy and configure your cloud native applications. I'm just referring to cloud because we are referring to AWS or cloud native aspects here, uh, but it can be your, you know, uh, on host or in your data center or anywhere, but you still consider some security aspects. But subsequently, these artifacts have proven to be source of numerous attacks uh, where it can be exploited in the runtime. So this, they go in more detail in the white paper. I would like to, you to, yeah, just go through it. What they, you know, there are more aspects with what they cover on this dollar phase. I would go to the next on the distribute. So this uh, distribute phase is basically where you're responsible for consuming the image definitions, uh, specifications to build the next stage of the artifacts, such as the container images. So where, uh, yeah, so VM images or any anything that's the output of your build stage or your develop stage, yeah. And uh, in modern CI/CD pipelines, uh, uh, usually the distributed phase consists of the systematic application testing, as you can see in the in the third row. 
uh, where you basically you do your unit test, integration test, system test, make sure they're okay. Otherwise, uh, it goes back to the development and the cycle continues. Yeah, that's your SDLC, software development lifecycle. So once you identify, okay, I'm I'm fine. Uh, we 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 pass through the test. So you do some, uh, yeah, you basically promote that into your next uh, test uh, phases. Yeah. So if you use more of an open source tools as part of your uh, application process or, or in the development phases, there is more chance of you know vulnerabilities and malware that, can, that comes into your container images because you don't know how they build it. You are not aware of how those images are signed. So that would be a problem uh, within your application uh, container images. So here, what they recommend is basically, you know, uh, to incorporate some sort of security process in the fourth column, as you can see. Once you've got the image, so you should have another phase of security testing where you can scan your vulnerabilities for container images, yeah, infrastructure as a code, compliance scan, and also you know, a manifest files and security compliance scan. So this can be done using various tools. So one of the two can be Sneak, which my you know, Talia has gone through, but I will show you some of the open source tools you, you could use as well. But the focus here is more on uh, scanning your images, any threats or validation of uh, your integrity of your images, of your application, and uh, just protect them from tampering, yeah? So that, that's the objective here. So organizers, uh, and you know, on the image integrity, and you can go one further step by also introducing encryption of your software as well uh, to make it more you know, confidential you know, and uh, more secure uh, using some uh, encryption keys and stuff. But that's uh, beyond this. But you can also harden it more by using encryption as well. So the next phase is uh, uh, deploy. So once you're happy with those scans, uh, you, you're OK. So uh, you need to promote them somewhere, right? You need to deploy them somewhere. So the deploy is basically responsible for incorporating a sequence of uh, pre-flight checks, as you can see. So validate the you know, image integrity, runtime policies, container policies. Yeah. So that applies for some Kubernetes. Some applies for your Docker images. Uh, you can also sign them, stuff like that. Uh, that will be deployed in the runtime uh, environment where your test environment or your production or you know mainly test environment before you put in the production. You have to make sure that complies with the your organization security standards or comp, you know company whatever po compliance policies you have. You have, you might want to run them, deploy, and you run those policies, make sure they're fit for purpose, and then yeah, you promote that into your next next step. So this again, they've defined it uh, very uh, detail in uh, in in the, in the white paper. I would like you to go through it. There are some standards which they also recommend to you, like CIS, yeah, uh, Center for Internet Security. They also have some the benchmark scripts, which you, you will want to run those scripts against your images. Check this, you know, uh, yeah, uh, security standards you would uh, comply, or you have to go back to your development lifecycle, you know, change, do some changes, make sure it fit for purpose, and uh, adopt some security best practices. So here, as I talked about host security, it's not just your container. So as soon as you install your image on your host, you also have to make sure your host is also fit for purpose on the security. There are no exploits or uh, you know uh, less vulnerable to uh, get hacked. So that we will cover in some of the tools in, in, in the coming slides. And container security as well. So here, the port security policies are Kubernetes network policy. Yeah, so if you're running any ports in your Kubernetes vanilla or, or in cloud, you might want to create an extra level of uh, security uh, by implementing uh, I don't know, separate namespaces, uh, tenant isolation. Yeah, you can the, the, the various things that you could use in uh, Kubernetes where you can implement uh, yeah container security. Some of them are here, and the last one is the runtime. So as you can see, uh, the runtime phase consists of uh, three critical areas. So one is the application, yes, yeah, so a compute. And the other one is the access, how you know, who we have access. And the third one is uh, storage, so where, where you store, how you basically, yeah, uh, what, what, what are all the storage components you have. Uh, so while the runtime environment is uh, dependent on successful completion of the develop, 
uh, distribute and deploy phases. The security of the runtime is uh, dependent on the efficiency of the security practices here yeah, of the of the phases what you implemented. So it's not just on this runtime, you just bring those secure, you're happy to run it, but you also have to ensure that uh, the previous phases which you which you incorporated the security standards are implemented, you're happy, yeah, you, you have a, a, a certain criteria to accept them. And then basically, yeah, it, it's very important to uh, adhere that and uh, to uh, finally to uh, yeah install them and uh, make sure uh, that they they comply. So yeah, on a high level, as you can see, uh, on the compute layer, you have you know some kind of you know uh, service mesh where you integrate. If you talk about Kubernetes mainly, you know how you integrate, how you control them, OS process control. Network encryption, yeah. So that's for the app and process, service access, and uh, yeah. So memory protection, those the stuff like that. On the access layer, on the cloud, you use identity access management. Uh, for any hyperscalers, you can control using uh, authorization, uh, authentication, and then authorization, what they can do. Uh, but here on the Kubernetes level, you can see RBAC, role-based access control, yeah, at the control band level, admission, network policy, sport security, we have seen that in the previous slides, so image authorization, data volumes. So this can be on your on your access level. So once you have the authentication, okay, user one is authenticated to access my cluster. I'm just taking a Kubernetes cluster. And then you will have another level of uh, control, uh, which is role-based access control, what that user can do within your cluster, run the port, or delete the pod, or create a new pod, that you can define in uh, RBAC, yeah, in your config map. Uh, and especially uh, network policies will add basically how you want to control your network, traffic on where your pods are running, that's more secure. The pod security, container security also defines how you would like to run your pods and how, yeah, what uh, other services that you would like to interact with, and uh, you define the authorization there by creating some policies, yeah. Uh, and attached to those uh, roles or users you would use in those uh, environment. On the data, I would uh, definitely suggest any data at rest should be encrypted uh, using uh, uh, you know uh, keys, uh, encryption keys. In cloud, you have cloud native keys or you use a, a customer managed keys, which you you can also use. Uh, and also the traffic which is going between your application, uh, which is data in transit. I would also suggest to encrypt the data using uh, TLS traffic, yeah, uh, by using a uh, certificate. Uh, either you can use cloud native ones, they, most of the hyperscalers provide uh, certificate managers where you can use to encrypt those data. And uh, yeah, uh, or you can use the certificate which you, uh, your corporate standards, which your company uses, you import them. Uh, so you export them basically and uh, to the cloud, and you can also uh, use encryption there for the uh, data in transit. So, so coming to the Docker file best practices. So here, I would say avoid any unnecessary privileges. So as I said, no, whenever you run uh, Docker, so the you know. Uh, Default, it takes as a root as a user, but the best practice is, you know, create a Docker user, create some, set some uh, group to it. You know, there is some uh, process where you have to, you can you can avoid using root. Uh, also, bind the, do not bind any, you know, uh, user identity or unique identity. Uh, make exhibitables one by root, not writable. So once you basically create an image or your, or, or the or, or the end image, so you make sure it's not writable. So that that's how the Docker image works in, a, in principle. Uh, any layer that you would like to change, which you write in your Docker file, uh, you it basically changes only that particular layer, and it rewrites uh, change that in your in your image. Yeah. Uh, reduce attack surface. Uh, there's some of the aspects which you know uh, Talia has mentioned are covered in the first session, where you must uh, probably you know. Uh, uh, make sure you the base images which you use to host your application on, like for example Alpine, Linux, or uh, I don't know uh, some uh, JDKs which you use. Make sure they are security compliant. Yeah, 
or you build from your scratch. Uh, if you're more confident, you, if you want to have more confidence, and uh, yeah, make sure you update those images very frequently, and uh, be careful what ports you would expose. Yeah, so that's this is very critical because yeah, this is very uh, uh, very most common uh, where where a bad actor or a hacker can get in and exploit your application by you know scanning your open ports and see how you can they can get in. So you have to be careful what kind of ports you want to you want to expose with a, for your application. Uh, that's where the good habit is. You know, uh, wherever you have a uh, like a web application or something, your traffic. Ideally, should and then you uh, create a, a kind of a proxy or a load balancer where the traffic from an end user uh, to the load balancer die. Uh, that will be encrypted, and you create a, another channel to your application, uh, another traffic where that will be also encrypted, but it will be a, a different. Yeah, it won't be directly from the end user to directly to your application. So the recommendation would be use some sort of a proxy or a load balancer to serve your traffic. Uh, from your end users, yeah, for your web applications. So never put secrets, credentials in Docker file. That's common sense, mostly. You know, there's a recent instances where users put the AWS uh, secrets in uh, GitHub. So what bad actors do is, you know, they scan the GitHub repositories for to find these access keys and secrets. So and they exploit the AWS accounts. I don't know, running you know uh, multiple EC2 instances. Giving you know, uh, which 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 will cost a lot uh, for the guys who own those accounts. So you have to be careful where you secure those credentials in a, uh, in, a, in you know in public repositories. There are some security best practices where you can use uh, you know GitHub secrets. You have environment variables where you could, don't have to expose them as part of your Docker files. So that would be a good practice. Or use uh, you know. Uh, uh, of some secrets manager or you know uh, for cloud native you have a lot of tools which supports that so parameter store where you can uh, save secrets manager you can save those passwords and then you call those variables in the runtime uh, when you're running your containers so that is also possible so uh, you don't expose your passwords or any secret database credentials yeah so those aspects you would you wouldn't uh, uh, expose to the wider audience so yeah, so this would be the uh, Docker bench for security. So when you're running the uh, when you're running the uh, uh, containers in your production host, uh, you might want to harden your image. As I said, uh, you, it will be uh, using Docker bench if you're running a production thing. So what Docker bench does, it has it's based on basically test all automated using a CIS Docker benchmark. Uh, I don't know if it's the latest one, but I will provide you a link uh, where you could where you could download and get more info. But this basically scans your Docker host for any common configuration issues or you know any loose settings that you would uh, you know uh, expose any common uh, you know vulnerabilities or exposures, and it gives you a rating or rank based on the result, and then you might want to fix them and you know. Uh, yeah, you, you would like to address them. So Docker Bench is a pretty useful tool. I, I use a lot on mine uh, uh, projects. Um, I'm just watching a question here. So can you tell a little bit more about exposed pools, how to check them? Uh, yes, there's a, you know, they are uh, some open source post scanning tools as well, where you could uh, use uh, to avoid those exposed ports. Uh, on top of my bad uh, head, but uh, I can uh, definitely refer you to some uh, tools, basically, which scans your local host, and uh, it, it will give you some sort of uh, metrics, what post is used by what, uh, yeah, is it really necessary, and uh, uh, you, you, you can uh, check them. But the Unix command is basically is netstat. Uh, I use netstat dash and that uh, TUP and it basically gives you all the. Uh, I will show you in a bit in the in the demo, but yeah, there, there are some tools as well which will uh, also uh, scan your ports on the host and it will also give you uh, some summary. Okay. Uh, okay.
Okay. Uh, the next one would be I, I just just to stay here a little bit to check on this uh, document security on the right hand side. The picture as you can see, that's my host. I want to make sure avoid unused uh, you know images. Uh, that would be my you know uh, Docker uh, kind of you know uh, housekeeping. Any volumes you mount, you use your data. You have to make sure you unmount them or you use a a shared file system, you have to be, yeah. You need to make sure, you know, a port being outbound to expose to the internet, 0, 0, 0, 0. you have to be careful. Uh, on the container side, as you can see, you know, the mount, uh, create a separate partitions for, depending on your data types, data, yeah. So make sure you, you don't put all the data together in uh, one place or, yeah. Uh, you can, uh, do not run SSH. So there are some uh, Docker exec where you can go inside the container and you can do, but um, the practice is basically some of those vulnerabilities or the tools within that uh, image, you can remove them to make sure they're more secure. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there are some tools which comes with that as well, the base images with very less or minimal. So the, I would recommend exploring some Alpine version of base images, which is very, a minimized version of actual uh, Ubuntu or actual the OS which you would like to run on. Uh, the Alpine versions are a little bit thinner, uh, contains exactly what you might need. For any additional thing or tools which you might need, you can just also install them. But uh, yeah, remove all essential services or any services which are running on your container. If you don't, don't, don't need it, stop them, you know, uh, try to, yeah, remove them. Uh, limit memory and CPU usage. So you can also set your, you know, uh, C and do Docker stat. It will give you consumption or how they're doing. You can also allocate by default, it takes your host uh, memory and CPU, but you can also set them in uh, in uh, in uh, cloud native world in, uh, when you're running in Amazon Web Services, for example, you, may, you can set those limits depending on your application. And uh, you can scale up, scale down as well, depending on the usage as well. Uh, but that I will cover in a bit. Uh, similarly, you have a cube bench for Kubernetes uh, uh, workloads, similar to Docker bench. So if you have a, a host where you're running, this doesn't apply for uh, cloud native because you know most of the managed services offered by hyperscalers the underlying infrastructure is maintained by the cloud providers hyperscalers so this more on if you want to run your vanilla kubernetes server you know setup you have on your host you have full access on your host where you have control you might want to use kubebench uh, to run across your uh, host and then it will give you a nice summary of how uh, yeah how well is your uh, how secure is your host and again, this has some uh, CSI benchmark standards, which it will scan and run across. And then it gives you a summary as well. I'll pop up the links. Okay, so vulnerability scanning for container images, right? So, so far we talked about, you know, what's your, what's the security uh, uh, scanning looks like or vulnerabilities, uh, what's these, you know, uh, white paper security thing, uh, white paper says, what, what kind of tools we can use for hardening your you know, host where you're running the containers. Now we're going to go a level down to see before I host my uh, container images, uh, how can I scan my container itself, your know, image itself, and make sure it's uh, it doesn't have any vulnerabilities. And how do I address those vulnerabilities? So some of the tools which we touched about as well is... Uh, you know, sneak, which my colleague Tyler has covered most of it, right? And uh, I'll skip that bit, but I will just quickly show you the Docker scan at the command line, but it just uses the sneak CLI in the background, you know, connects to the sneak uh, vulnerability database, and it gives you a nice summary as well. But I also tried to explore some of the open source uh, uh, tools where you could use uh, where you would like to have full control, no limitations that you would like to have. So I would also suggest Aqua Trivia. You can also use it. Works for most of uh, yeah uh, container images. It also scans your file systems as well. 
and Git repositories. Uh, and it gives you a nice summary. I, I can show you in the demo as well in a bit. But uh, this is a nice little tool, which uh, I also use quite often. And the next one is the Docker Slim and uh, Grip. Docker Slim basically scans your container image and try to minimize the size of your image. Yeah? So it basically scans and see, analyzes your layers, what you have now kept on your Docker file. Uh, it understands or uh, try to analyze, are they really required for your running application? Or can you minimize, uh, you know, avoid those unnecessary layers on top of uh, your for your application? So, and it gives you a summary. Once you decide it, it basically, yeah, get rid of all the unnecessary ones. Uh, they claim that it minimizes your document by 30 times, uh, so which is pretty good, uh, I would say. And uh, I haven't used it much personally, to be honest with you, but I would definitely recommend uh, for your applications which have, you know, a big uh, size, uh, where you would like to planning to minimize it or understand what's in there. Uh, with a nice summary, I would suggest yeah, Docker Slim. So Grip is another nice tool for a vulnerability scanner for your Docker images, container images. Uh, it can be easily installed. You can uh, download them. You can also use it uh, to generate your software bill of materials. And uh, yeah, I will show you in the demo how the output looks like when you scan using Grip. Uh, I, I used less, to be honest, but I really like it as well, how, the, how, it's, how it simplifies and summaries. So it's not, it, it's a good, good tool. I can show you in a bit. Okay, and content image lifecycle. This is okay. So far, we've talked about okay, how you're gonna scan or make sure your container hosts are fit for purpose. What kind of tools you can use? Yeah, well, how do you check your vulnerabilities? And we also talked about how you scan your docker images or container images. How you what tools we can use? Open source, Flake, and how you address them. So now, on a high level, what's your container lifecycle look like, right? Uh, you do a pre-check, you build your Docker file, you do some analysis, you basically create in your local development environment, you do some testing, right? You build the image and you push it, you scan and you push it to your registry. So once you push it in the registry, so you then the CI pipeline starts. So you want you might want to test your chain, test your chain, so it automatically. If you use uh, familiar with Git, uh, you use Git pipelines uh, to deploy that in, uh, in, a, in a development environment. And you do your test uh, quickly, unit testing, whatever testing you want to do. If you're happy, you promote it further. That means distribute. Uh, if you're not happy, it goes back to your development lifecycle. You fix those changes or you scan again. Make sure you fix those vulnerabilities and then you publish as well. So, and in addition to this, you, if you're using any cloud uh, tools, for example, uh, Amazon ECR or something, uh, as part of your Git pipeline or your development uh, pipeline, you might want to do those runs, uh, which I've shown you with the open source tools or Snake, to make sure the image is fit for purpose uh, before you push it to your central uh, image registry like ECR. So that so ECR or your central repository uh, registry will contain all the scanned or valued uh, uh, tested, trial, scanned images so that you can promote to your test and uh, production from there. So this is a good habit, or I would I encourage people to use uh, your uh, container scanning as part of your development pipeline. So that will help you. So yeah, uh, development, uh, deployment after that. So once you have a happy with your uh, image which you published in your registry, you might want to scan there as well, so I will show you how it works on the ECR. Uh, and then you basically deploy on your test, and again, the cycle, you scan, admission checks, and then finally you runtime uh, image scanning. So once you host your runtime image running, you might also want to scan your host right there for any vulnerabilities you want to do. And then, yeah, so application runs, a container destroys nothing but once you want to stop the container, so you basically have to do, do, uh, stop the container and uh, yeah, how you want to orchestrate your containers. So that depends on your tool you use. Uh, yeah. So that's on the container image lifecycle. I uh, would quickly 
point of view services on Amazon Web Services where you want to, if you're interested to run your containers on Amazon Web Services, I would uh, say uh, Amazon ECR is the Elastic Container Registry where you basically host or save your images uh, in, uh, in, uh, in cloud. Amazon ECS is Elastic Container Service where you would run your containers using this ECS and it orchestrates as well. Uh, in a sense, if you if you're familiar with you know uh, Docker uh, Docker Swarm or you know uh, things like that, so it basically Docker Compose it basically orchestrates that uh, container images uh, and how to run, uh, how you want to run, you know how you want to scale it, uh, stuff like that, how you want to make it you know users to be available. All that bits you can completely manage within the Elastic Container Service. So EKS is uh, nothing but same with Kubernetes, uh, but completely uh, hosted and managed by Amazon. They, you won't have uh, access to the uh, host uh, where the control plane is uh, installed or you know running. They give you an API or endpoint where you can run your pods. You create a cluster and then run your pods uh, or anything on top of that uh, uh, EKS. Yeah, Elastic Kubernetes service, yeah. So those are the, there's Fargate, there's there's a couple of other services as well. But I would like to just to have benefit of time, I would like to concentrate on this mainly. And uh, if you're familiar with uh, you know uh, ECR running on uh, and uh, familiar with uh, how you use it on Amazon Web Services, this is how you would like to scan your images and get notified for your you know uh, ops team or your dev team. So as soon as the developer push the image in your local registry or the you know as part of your CI pipeline, continuous integration pipeline, uh, it triggers a using a event bridge rule, uh, some scans. So ECR itself have uh, some scanning ability. Uh, it scans the image which you pushed and gives you a summary of same you know critical, medium, high, low, uh, and based on that you can create a SNS topic, a simple notification service, uh, which will basically trigger an email to your to your team. Uh, okay, the image I pushed contains I don't know two critical, ten high, and yeah, uh, fifty low. So based on that output, you might want to go back to your development, address those critical ones. Yeah, you define some criteria where you would like to address those uh, vulnerabilities and push it back on the registry again. So this is an automated way how you can orchestrate. Uh, as part of your complete uh, development pipeline. So this helps uh, the developers to quickly analyze those images without running locally and uh, get notified. And then, yeah, look into those vulnerabilities and fix them and push it to the, you know, your central repository back again. So this is completely uh, can be managed and uh, triggered within the uh, AWS side. Uh, but some of the aspects which I told you, the open source before you push it to ECR, you can also do that in your in your uh, GitLab pipeline or yeah CI pipeline here locally as part of your pipeline. So that's on the uh, image scanning using uh, Elastic Container Registry. Uh, quickly on the Kubernetes, uh, I don't want to drill down on the cluster level. How will you run on uh, Amazon? Uh, we already covered. The, I already covered this in our Container Immersion Day. Some of you have joined as well. Uh, so here we focus on the security aspects. Yeah. So when you host or when you use Kubernetes service on Amazon, what are the best practices for the security? Yep. Uh, so some of the aspects which we would like to uh, highlight is the identity access management, uh, which is basically uh, authentication, uh, where basically who have access to your cluster, uh, who have access to basically can log into your cluster to run your kubectl and access your yeah, ports or what level of access they have. So after you authenticate using IAM, you can also have another level of control within your Kubernetes using RBAC, which I which pointed out you know, previously. Uh, you can define those role-based access, role-based you know, controls, depending on uh, system masters will give you a full control of the cluster, system discovery you know, will give up some discovery, less privileges, depending on your actor. Yeah? So depending on your team, you can also define those uh, uh, authorization concept within uh, RBAC. So port security, again, you have you can apply some security policies. You can runtime security. You want to make sure your your ports you're running on are secure. 
uh, network, <coughs> sorry, network security, you can apply some network policies as well as when you're running. And yeah, Kubernetes, multi-tenancy, I briefly explained before, you can use some uh, namespaces to isolate your resources between your teams, between your applications to make sure, you know, uh, to not to interact with your, I don't know, Derby or backend, your, you know, application to database or stuff like that, depending on your role. You can use uh, multi-tenancy as a, as a segregation of your of your applications of your of yeah using namespaces and uh, stuff like that detective controls infrastructure security I mean this is mainly managed uh, uh, to a level of uh, by Amazon Web Services uh, infrastructure security but it's a shared responsibility they call it so anything uh, you know in the cloud uh, is uh, Amazon uh, Web Services uh, you know responsibility. Anything you know on the cloud which you host is your customer responsibility. So you might want to make sure you use a hardened image. You might want to make sure you have some security policies in place. You have a a proper IAM access and management in place. Yeah. So those bits you, you encrypt your data. Use secret manager management. So those 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 aspect uh, you might want to look into as well. So image security we've gone through. So use uh, use tools, use ECR to scan your images, make sure they fit for purpose. Any incident response or forensics that need to be done. So you make sure you have a, you can uh, restrict the access on that you know uh, on that host. Give access to you know, uh, yeah, to the investigation team or your operations where you would like incident team management team, uh, where they can get control and see what's going on as well. So yeah. So these are the main aspects I would say to uh, implement on top of uh, EKS clusters if you're running on Amazon Web Services. A few aspects are like, you know, when you use uh, uh, managed EKS uh, on AWS, you have some responsibility metrics on, from security point of view. Uh, one is, you know, self-managed workers and uh, managed nodes. So here, as you can see, all the orange ones are taken care of by uh, the cloud, uh, Amazon uh, Web Services. Anything on the blue on the left side uh, is customer managed, uh, which makes sense, right? So all the control plane, the host related stuff, Amazon makes sure it's highly available, make sure it's secure, you're running. Uh, it will take your headache off, you know, you hardening it because Amazon to a level will make sure it, it's compliant. Uh, anything that you host, in your clusters like customer data, your images, your source code, yeah, uh, your configuration, uh, how your network, how you manage is, is basically your responsibility to manage it. And how you would like to do achieve that, uh, we discussed some of the aspect by security policies, network policies, tenant isolation, yeah, multi-tenancy, stuff like that. So RPAC, uh, yeah, IAM, yeah, my configuration, so all that we can do. So these are self-managed. When you, when I say self-managed, your nodes which you're running, it's basically your responsibility. You take care about your OS level, uh, uh, operating system level matches where you using on the EC2 instances. You you manage, you you control them. On the managed nodes, basically, you wouldn't be able. To, uh, you you don't want to have to worry about what where you're running. So this managed nodes will be responsible for Amazon. You basically uh, take care about the configuration on top of it. Uh, any nodes which are running on yeah, network, VPC, worker node scaling, that you define and you manage anything on top of your application data and uh, your container images. We also have a concept of Fargate, uh, which means uh, you don't have to worry about scaling as well. So this doesn't uh, uh, give you access to the underlying infrastructure. So AWS provision for you, they manage it and they scale it depending on your uh, threshold you define, uh, which is required for your applications to run on run. So this it can be also managed, uh, yeah, by Amazon Web Services. As you know, the self-managed is here, so you manage it. You you can control. Uh, depending on your use case, you know, some some uh, companies would like to have uh, more control on where you would like to run your image, you know, a container. So in that case, you might want to use self-managed worker nodes where you, you have control. Uh, some companies probably, you know, you run some process and you stop. Yeah, it's not continuously running. You you, you don't worry about 
uh, where you run on or how you know, how secure the underlying host is. So you might want to use a far getter for a, a quick process running. So that uh, it depends on your use case. You might want to choose you know, which direction you would like to go. So yeah, on a high level, this is uh, uh, on EKS side. I just would like to, this is all I would like to cover. Uh, but I would like to see if any questions in the chat or anything pop up. Okay. Yeah. So just a quick <clears throat> recap of what we what we did. Uh, we covered most of the aspects on uh, cloud native. A high level, very high level on security white paper, what phases they have, yeah. Uh, the dollar distribute and deploy, uh, runtime. Uh, we also identified what are the best practice for writing the Docker file. We identified what are the open source tools you can use to harden your host where you run your containers using Docker Bench and Cube Bench. Uh, they're completely open source and you can download from GitHub. Uh, vulnerability scanning. So we went to another level of uh, uh, security where you could scan your images uh, you, using various open source tools, uh, including Sneak, uh, which uh, we have a demo. So yeah, we also looked into how you basically min, you know, uh, minify your doc images by reducing unnecessary space, unnecessary uh, layers in your images by using Docker Slim. Uh, that's open source uh, and grip for vulnerability scanning. Uh, learn about image lifecycle, what tools you can use to run on Amazon Web Services uh, to run your uh, container workloads. High level on uh, you know uh, how you integrate your image scanning or vulnerability scanning as part of your development pipeline in your you know wherever you're running on your on-prem to your host and you know uh, on your on your cloud using ECR. How you trigger the alerts, uh, notification to your teams, uh, completely automated. What are the best practices for security on hosting on, uh, yeah, on uh, EKS? And uh, yeah, and how you, what are the different types of uh, offerings they do, self managed versus uh, Fargate versus managed? So, yeah, so that that's uh, the, that's what I would like to show from my demo, to be honest, on a high level. I would also would like to share this one second. A few resources which I would like to also uh, put on the chat. A few links. Yeah, but yeah. Any questions from the chat? I'm just looking. Yeah, there are a lot of ways to show the security. Yes, uh, start with the security. So I would say, uh, yeah, don't go too uh, deep on how you, if you're starting a container journey or, or and you're looking for <clears throat> some uh, container security aspects, start with, you know, a slow, small Docker, build your image, uh, do some POCs, use the open source, use Snake, scan it, you know, just, just to a small scale. Don't go to like, you know, Kubernetes with, uh, yeah, 10, 50 ports running it uh, to that level. So understand how the security works on a, on a, on a port level. Understand what all tools we have. Uh, you can, you can utilize uh, open source tools. Uh, yeah, that, that would, that, that would be a good start, I would say. So I would like to show you uh, some of the sources, which I would like to also paste here in the chat. So one of my, I wrote a few blogs on the container security, so feel free to over here and also my medium as well. 
Okay, we have a question from Nikita. Is there any other way to implement security on Kubernetes except KubeBench? Yeah, of course. I mean, KubeBench just to harden your host where you run your pods here. Yeah? Uh, you have uh, various aspects where you would like to implement security on Kubernetes, uh, which I've just gone through. Like, uh, for example, let, let me bring back the slide. Uh, multi-tenancy, security policies, you know, uh, isolation, network isolation, stuff like that. So it's pretty, pretty useful. Kubeage is one, ac one aspect of it, to be honest. So, okay, let me... Yeah, but I'll share these resources uh, uh, in the meetup. I'll send an email or we can, we can share some of the details as well. Okay, another question. When you deploy your application onto many different availability zones, to have availability on uh, all over the world, then those open source vulnerability scanners also provide right quality scanning. Uh, this depends on how you, how you host your application, right? So what happens is you, you, uh, you have a web application, for example, some, uh, some uh, I don't know, some internet site or I don't know, Facebook, some, some, some uh, web application. You make sure your application itself is secure, right? So when you host your application on cloud, uh, you, two aspects. One, how, how you make your application more you know, uh, highly available uh, by using different availability zones. You use uh, certain tools, your application load balancers, your... I don't know, CloudFront, your, your you know, content you know, distribution network tools you might want to use, uh, CloudFront. Uh, the other aspect is once you, once you expose your application, how you make sure that you, know, uh, you won't bring in these you know, uh, vulnerabilities. Or you, uh, there, from there on, it's more of you know, a hack, you know, a bad actors looking to explore your application. So which comes in a way like, uh, yeah, so users trying to scan your ports on your application, scan any vulnerabilities on your application through, yeah, through the, you know, end users. So that's why you need to create a bridge uh, directly not to your application. So maybe you might want to introduce a proxy. You might want to introduce an application load balance, uh, yeah, where you the traffic will end, you encrypt, and you then divert the traffic again internally from your application to your, you know, database and your, yeah various services which you would like to talk to. So there are various aspects, how you can manage it within the hyperscale. It depends on hyperscaler to hyperscaler. Uh, but in uh, AWS, you can use application load balancers. Uh, you can use built-in application uh, uh, certificate managers, ACM, uh, to uh, encrypt your data. You can use KMS, a key management service, to encrypt the data at rest for any of the data you database. Uh, EBS volumes, your your file system, wherever you stay, you, you can encrypt your data. Uh, yeah. But the scanning, vulnerability scanning comes before you actually expose to the whole world, right? So that's the whole point. So the, the message here is basically uh, make sure your, your application is uh, you know, free from any vulnerabilities that the bad actors can get in and they don't hack and uh, cause damage. Yeah. So that's a whole whole thing. So between your development uh, life cycle, different your development pipeline, you might want to introduce uh, some of the uh, vulnerability scanning tools, which we've gone through, and make sure it's hardened. Uh, yeah, please use a hardened image as well when you're creating your, you know, hosting your application where you want to run. And uh, once you're happy with those aspects, the the, the cycles, you know, which we've gone through, which uh, CNCF recommends as well, you know, on the develop, you know, uh, build, you know, run uh, th th those those phases which we've gone through, distribute. The, you have to make sure you have uh, every uh, quality gate between all those phases. So any phase that you would like to promote to the next one, you should have a quality gate running some uh, tools, running some scans to make sure you have some entry exit criteria uh, between your pipelines. To make sure they, yeah, they, they won't cause uh, any uh, other damage when you go to the you know uh, host in your production. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you basically make sure uh, you scan on your pipeline using open source, 
uh, once you're hosted in ECR, you can also do another scan on ECR. There, there's a functionality called uh, push-on scan. Uh, that's also, yeah, uh, possible. I would like to show you uh, a command line a demo quickly. Uh, uh, what I can uh, do, one second. Nothing fancy. I have a couple of images on my local machine. I would like to show you to how how the scan works from the command line to uh, one second. Uh, right. Uh, let me know. You can see my screen. Okay, so here, basically, I would like to show you uh, one second. Do, do. Right, there you go. I think it's, I'm just checking, make sure you, you it's, give me a thumbs up if you can uh, see my screen clear otherwise i'll try to increase a little bit but hopefully i think it's it's visible so i'm uh, typing doc images so it gives me a list of doc images what i have on my local host yeah so i would like to show you for example i have alpine hello world mango db yeah these are uh, images which i took it from docker hub so what i would like to do so i would like to make sure these images what i would like to use are not not vulnerable to something, yeah, or, or or fit for purpose for my for my development. So I would like to scan them to make sure they're okay. So I would use grip first. Uh, grip has its own vulnerability database which scans the Mango DB uh, doc image. It gives a nice summary of what vulnerability it has, if it has any, and it also rates what. Uh, what those vulnerabilities are, like uh, this format, yeah? So what's the severity of them? So I'm using Grip. It's open source. You can install. I, I It's there on the blog, which I shared you as well, how to how to install and how to get those tools. I'll also share some uh, links uh, in a bit. But yeah, so it's, it's a nice summary. So these are all the vulnerabilities you, you can see. And it also ranks how uh, severe they are. So if I'm not seeing any critical or high, uh, yeah, to some extent I'm okay, but you might want to use, scan the medium ones as well. But as you can see, it looks, I don't have any critical and high uh, vulnerabilities in this MacroDB one. Yeah, so I use, uh, I want to use Docker scan as well on this. Uh, behind the scenes, it uses uh, grip, uh, so, sorry, sneak, Docker scan, and Mongo. Oh, okay, so I need to log in. Okay, I haven't configured here, so I just uh, skip this. I can use uh, Trivi. Uh, Trivi is another open source which I've uh, shown you on the presentation. So what it does is it scans the image, uh, it gives a nice tabular format on the same image, so Docker. Uh, Sorry, MongoDB. So as you can see, you, you can have the same result. There's no critical or high. And uh, what it also gives you a nice title on that uh, vulnerability. So where you can go investigate more to understand the vulnerability, how you fix it. But yeah, so this is a nice neat tool I, I like to use. I use this as well. Trivi, it's open source. You can deploy, install on your host. And uh, you can, the beauty of these things, the reason why I'm showing is, you know, uh, as part of your pipeline, it's very uh, easy to integrate those these scans when you uh, when you build your image. This this would be the output of your of your of your development pipeline. And based on these results, you can also have some uh, exit criteria to push this image to your registry. Yeah, so this is really really useful. Okay, so I would also like to show you. Docker Slim, 
uh, Dr. Slim, as I said, it uh, scans your image and, and you know uh, it identifies what layers you have, and you know you can assess them. You see, okay, what's important, you know, the, and basically you can also reduce the size of your images as well. So as you can see, it creates a lot of information on the layers, what this image have, yeah, what kind of versions, uh, yeah. So very human readable uh, in a form, but this is also pretty useful when you would like to reduce your size of your images. And uh, finally, we have one more. Yeah, we use Trivi. Yeah, uh, just about time. Yeah, we. I would like to. Uh, I will uh, do another scan on uh, Hello World. Yeah, say, so, okay, so. So there you go. So it just uh, scans that image and just gives you info. It's a very small image, so it doesn't contain much. Uh, but yeah, so I would stop here because we are right on time on 11.50. So I would... Uh, with this and see if you have any other questions on uh, what we've gone through so far. Cool. Any other questions? What do you use on your production workloads? Any uh, real-time uh, issues you're facing or any, any of your, yeah, any inputs you would like to know? Any use cases you would like to discuss, uh, yeah, feel free. But pretty good questions uh, from uh, Nikita, Chaba, and a few of you guys. Thank you. Uh, there's one question uh, came up. Uh, so those are the SaaS tools, right? Uh, Right, uh, so some of, some of the uh, aspects, yes, uh, they are, uh, w w what he meant by SAST and DAST is some are like, you know, constant static and some are like dynamic, some of the cha which changes with the real world thread. So some of the tools he use are <clears throat> kind of uh, static, but some, they also upgrade their database as and when you know the new threats are uh, introduced, uh, most of those uh, vulnerability tools they embedded they include them in the in the, in the database as well. So it's not like these two, they more of a uh, static, but you could also use them as uh, yeah on the uh, yeah, dynamic uh, application testing as well. But it's mostly yes uh, static application security testing. That's what you would uh, run in a way. But you have to make sure if you're hosting any uh, clay DB or Encore, uh, you, you want to make sure that your database is up to date. Otherwise, it, it cannot find the vulnerabilities if you don't update your database. Yeah, so It's very important that uh, you update your vulnerability database. Or if you use tools like Sneak or anything which is uh, or software as a service, kind of cloud hosted ones, they will make sure uh, they, they have up to date. Uh, yeah. Uh, vulnerability database and then yeah okay uh, there's one more question uh, we can scan images weekly but difficult to act on those yes when the image is not in active development anymore so retesting any good practice uh, you can recommend yes uh, that's a good question uh, TT uh, what this is uh, whenever you have a vulnerability or you know, uh, found any issues with your uh, development pipeline or, uh, on the image, it's good practice you, you develop some automated testing as well. Because if you have any manual testing, you have uh, waiting for some, uh, some, some resource to act upon manually based depending on the result. It will always be uh, time. It will always be difficult, yes. Uh, but what I would recommend is, you know, as 
as you've seen the, some of the slides, what CNCF recommend, you should have some automated uh, test scripts uh, or auto remediation as well, depending on common, you know, or common issues, common things. In uh, in uh, cloud world, you have some, uh, you know, uh, auto remediation a concept which you can achieve uh, depending on uh, common, uh, yeah, config issues, some other thing. If you find for example, a bucket open to the whole world, yeah. So you just lock it. Or if you have this uh, file contains a password or sensitive information, yeah. So delete it or remove it, stuff like that. So there is some automated remediation things which you could implement. But uh, yeah, so when the image is not active, which means, you know, you you don't have to wait, wait to run those images or containers. You can also scan those images before you even run on your host, right? So that's the that's the best practice which we would like to recommend. So any of your in within your development pipeline, one of the stage would be uh, after you create a Docker build and get a Docker image, run some open source tools, run Snake, run uh, some of the tools to scan your images, find your vulnerabilities before you when you push into your Docker registry or container registry, and then you know fix them. But you know it, it goes goes in a cycle that way. Uh, but that's a good practice is find uh, some uh, uh, auto remediation test auto <clears throat> or test automated test on top of your development process before you push it to your central registry uh, i would definitely suggest to read that uh, white paper uh, it covers a lot of bits which i didn't cover uh, because of the time uh, but i definitely would suggest these aspects they, they covered a lot of bits in the cncf white paper we have one more from uh, Monji, uh, the real world scenario because before remediation, any CVE, does it require approval from the SecOps team? <clears throat> the organization or typically DevOps uh, simply go ahead and uh, updates it. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, whenever we have any security vulnerabilities as part of your development cycle, it would be DevOps, yeah, DevSecOps or DevOps, you call it. Uh, you have to make sure uh, that cycle uh, is 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 automated within your pipeline. So, but before you host it in your application, but so before you goes to the production or your you know going uh, in your test, that's when you need another stakeholder uh, from your operations to make sure. Uh, okay, uh, they've done some tests. Uh, they're happy. So just a click of a button, and then maybe they they deploy in your test as well. But this should be part of your DevSecOps lifecycle. Yeah. So you 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 have some remediations, you fix some uh, CVEs. You don't need approval for your dev to test it, make sure it fit for purpose. Yeah. So that's that's up to your development team. That should be continuous integration. But as soon as you move on to you want to move to production, you might want to uh, you might want to involve some of the operations folks to have a give a heads up or approval process depending on your change control, uh, change management process. How you uh, organization have. Uh, yeah, you might want to adopt that depending on your company standards. But the good practice would be working very closely with operations. Make sure they they understand your uh, uh, country, your uh, CI process. Have you addressed those vulnerabilities? Have you scanned them so they appreciate? I mean, obviously, you know, the more security vulnerabilities you fix, it's uh, your security team will be more happy. You know, so yeah, that's a good question. Okay. Yeah, if you have still more questions, uh, feel free to join our uh, Discord community, please. It's a very uh, a vibrant community, I would say. Uh, we, we do have events coming up, uh, you know, uh, across uh, various various topics, various security topics. We have a lot of uh, expertise uh, from various ar around the globe who can also actively involve as well so yeah i would definitely suggest joining the community uh, to learn more or share your knowledge as well some of the experts here who have uh, no knowledge that, that would be a very good community yes so we have one minute left uh, i would say uh yeah thank you for everyone who joined today i can recognize some of the names as well who followed me from the aws events as well i really thank you everyone i do join uh, part of the DevSecOps, the new members as well. Uh, I, I'm really thankful and grateful for you guys. I would uh, 
Yeah, we would uh, shortlist some of the guys who stick to the event and uh, we would publish them. We will reach them uh, with the AWS vouchers. And uh, yeah, we will, uh, uh, yeah, hopefully you will continue your journey on the container topics on uh, various uh, topics, security aspects. I'm looking forward for coming events as well. And uh, yeah, that's the message for me. I'm really glad that we have a good good audience, good questions, and uh, hopefully we did uh, we did well. Or yeah, maybe you will take away something from here, some security aspects, something new maybe, and uh, we still, we can still be in touch on our uh, Discord channel, and we can uh, happy to help or share more information there. Cool. In that case, uh, yeah. I, I would like to uh, say thank you, everyone. And I would, uh, I would, uh, yeah, thanks, Santosh. Thanks you, Manjit, uh, Nikita. Uh, thanks you, Tale. Uh, I would really appreciate Tale getting up, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning, his time uh, from Brazil to support me in this event. Uh, Sam for, you know, helping me in this event uh, from uh, behind the scenes. Uh, the whole DevSecOn community is really wonderful. How how they support each other and, you know, uh, bring value to local communities. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tale. Thank you, DevSecOp and team. And uh, thank you, the audience. You, you've been a very wonderful audience today. So thank you, guys. I will uh, send the vouchers separately to the shortlisted candidates in the meetup emails or in the DevSecOp and if I, if I see you around. But you will receive them, yeah, today sometime for sure. So thank you guys. Have a good day, and uh, I look forward for coming events. To yeah, see you guys again. Bye bye.